Hi everyone, and welcome to the International Relations Subject Talk, part of the LSE Open Day 2021. My name is Dr. Luca Tardelli. I'm Assistant Professorial Lecturer in International Relations at the LSE. And today I have the great opportunity to tell you a bit more about what the subject of international relations is, what studying international relations really means, and what makes studying international relations at the LSE different and particularly exciting. I'm also the program director of the BSc IR degree program, the, the main BSc undergraduate program in international relations at the LSE. So I'll take the opportunity to tell you more about the degree program itself, its structure, the main courses, how teaching is delivered and assessed, and also the broader support available in the program. So let me start right away. This is the plan for this uh, video briefing. First, I will go through what international relations is, namely the subject of international relations. There on the slide, you can already see the acronym or abbreviation that I'm going to use in this presentation, namely IR, capital I, capital R, to indicate the subject itself and to distinguish it from international relations, small i, small r, that encompasses just everything that happens in the world. So I will be talking a lot of times about IR, and that's what I mean, the subject of international relations. Then I'll move to the second point, which is why studying IR at the LSE? What makes it different? What makes it peculiar? How do we teach IR at the LSC? Then I'll move to the BSc degree program in international relations. As I said, I will tell you a little bit more about the structure itself and other relevant information. Then I'll touch briefly on the entry requirements for this program. However, please do check the information of relevant sessions provided by the LSE Undergraduate Admissions Office. And I'll conclude with some information on the career destinations of our graduate students. So that's the plan. Let me start then from the big question, what is international relations? I could start right away by telling you what international relations is, or at least try to do so. But before going into that, I would like you to think a little bit about what do you think when you think about international relations? What are the first images that come to your mind? What are the news items? What are the things that you looked or seen or read recently that you would immediately associate with international relations? And I bet you would think about many different events, many different actors, many different issues, and that's fine because that's part of all of that is part of international relations. And I just wanna give you a few examples of the things, of the events, of the issues that would count as being part of international relations. So if you think about international relations, some of you, for instance, may think, especially if you're based in Britain and London, you may think right away about an issue that has been on, in the news for such a long time now, it seems forever, which is Brexit. So there you can see uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and European Commission President, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out whether the UK is leaving or not. And this, of course, is part of international relations. Why? Because it is about relations between states, member states, but specifically in this case, between a, a nation state, a particular member state of the United Kingdom, with a supranational organization such as the European Union. So some of you may have thought about Brexit. That's a good guess. It's international relations, of course, and we've been discussing and teaching and researching on Brexit for quite some time now in the department. But some of you may be thinking about um, relations between bilateral relations between states, between great powers. There on the slide, you have an image of a recent summit in March 2021 between the United States and the PRC, the People's Republic of China. This is, you know, an example of the kind of issues or the kind of events that you'll be looking at if looking and studying international relations. Why? Because it's a particularly relevant summit. is a, a diplomatic exchange between not only two states, but two very particular states, two great powers. So there, we, we know that their actions matter particularly for international stability and peace. And for instance, this was a rather tense summit. So the key background question all the time is, will these countries, will these great powers be able to cooperate or is there a risk of conflict or further tensions between the two? So when asked, when seeing the question, what is international relations? What will you be studying? Some of you may have thought about diplomatic relations between states or great powers, maybe thinking about the US, maybe thinking about China, the rise of China, for instance. Some of you may be looking more and maybe more interested in tensions between great powers or issues of conflict and war. And of course, this is also international relations. Actually, a core theme 
in international relations since its beginnings of the discipline. But many other of you maybe have thought about something slightly different, namely international cooperation on specific global issues. There you have a picture at the Paris Agreement on climate change back in 2015. This is a story of success so far, story of, of success in terms of coming up with an agreement on how to tackle climate change. And this picture is telling you two stories if you think about it. One is the international institution you know, devoted to tackling international issues such as the UN, the UNFCC in this case in particular, but also it tells you something about the global issue itself, namely in this case, climate change. Climate change is by definition, a global issue. It doesn't stop at anyone's border, right? So if you think of international relations this way, you're also thinking the right way because this is also international relations. A much more recent example is this, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has been there for quite some time, of course, but now we've become more familiar with these pictures. And in the picture you have Dr. Tedros, the Secretary General of the WHO, because of the COVID pandemic. And again, some of you may be thinking, when thinking about international relations, maybe thinking about international institutions or international or regional institutions, and also international global issues. What is more global by definition than a pandemic? So also this is, is a key topic and has been, of course, a key topic of our debates in international relations among researchers, but also in, in the classroom. So how is COVID changing or affecting international relations? And what is this telling us about the connections between societies and states across the world? And what about the international response to COVID? But some of you may be thinking about something completely different, namely maybe thinking of international relations more on the economic dimension of it. For instance, international trade or international finance, namely the connection happening between states and society and economies, exactly at the economic level at different levels. There I've put a picture, a very recent picture, as you know, of the evergreen container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. And, you know, this is again just an example and, you know, an example that I've provided for a lot of memes these days, but it's an example of the importance of international trade, of shipping lanes across the world. But also, if you think about it, it's telling you a story of the fragility of this international trade. How can it, it, it can be easily disrupted? So if some of you are thinking in this way, again, you're thinking in the right way. Also, this is international relations, right? But, you know, there are other movements, right, across the globe. One of it very important and has been important for quite some time now is migration, migration fluxes across across regions, across countries as a key policy issues in many different countries and, and regions. And now this is a picture, for instance, of migrants crossing the Mediterranean Sea. But as we know, in international, international history, we've had major migration fluxes across the globe. Think about the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, all the migration from the old world to the United States, just to give you an example, but there are many, many more. And again, you may be thinking of international relations a different way. The key point I'm trying to make is all of this is international relations. All of this has a key international component and it involves states, as in the very early um, pictures that I've showed you, where any states, supranational actors, or even great powers may involve international institutions, such as the UN, the FCCs, World Health Organizations. It may be about global issues, climate change, uh, pandemics, migration. But there's more than that, if you think about it. It's not just about states, right? It's not just about international institutions. There are also phenomena that sometimes we may think of as being primarily, primarily domestic, primarily local. And yet they may have enormous international repercussion. Actually, international contexts and settings may be part of the explanations of why these local phenomena happen. Think about, you have a picture of Tahrir Square back in 2011 and the Arab Spring, right? I mean, the importance of this event, but the Arab Spring really didn't start in Egypt, it started in Tunisia, and then it spread very quickly to, to Egypt and other countries. And again, we may think, for instance, of protests and revolutions as being something that happens within a state, but we know that this is not the case. They tend to spread. Revolutions tend to be exported, tend to be replicated. And not only that, they tend to have major international consequences. If we think of the Arab Spring, you may think, for instance, at the repression 
of protests in Syria and how this led to the Syrian civil war, which is still going on. But it's not just in the Middle East, right? These are protest movements that are learning from each other as well, as much as the authoritarian regimes dealing with them learning from each other. But protest movements are characterizing many of many countries these days and many regions. So it's not just 2011 in, in the Middle East, but it's also, if you think about it, the Hong Kong protest. This is a picture taken, I think, in December or November 2019. And again, if, if you look at this from this perspective, protests and revolutions seem like a regional or global phenomenon with important implications. Think about the implications of this protest for China's foreign policy, for instance, and its position or relations vis-a-vis -vis Western countries. But look even closer, more recently, right? Think about the Black Lives Matter movement, it started primarily in the United States, but it's not just an American phenomenon anymore, and it's shaping our debate profoundly. This picture, for instance, is, it was taken, I think, uh, last year in London. So again, it's not just confined to the United States, and it's pushing for a debate on issues that are of profound importance to international relations, issues of race, racism, and empire, which again, is not just about states. International relations that have been shaped by empires in a profound, profound way. So why did I give you all these pictures? It's to make you think and reflect on all the possible examples that may be international relations. And the key point is that all of this is. So let me move to my next slide. What is then international relations? Well, you can take, and this is absolutely fine, you can take a more traditional or focus and narrow view of international relations, namely seeing international relations as the relations between states. So diplomatic relations, relations between states that may you know, verge or end up into conflict and then war. So you may think of international relations as, as the subject studying relations between states, st uh, context and examples of war, diplomacy, cooperation between states and so forth, and even economic exchanges between them, namely primarily between states. But you can also, as my previous example will indicate, you can also take a more expansive understanding of international relations. Namely, an understanding that encompasses both the traditional understanding that I've just discussed, namely the one focused on state, primarily states, but also more than that, moving beyond that, namely to encompass all these global issues that we just discussed, climate change, migration, but also all other relevant non-state actors, whether international institutions, but think about, well as, as well to, I don't know, NGOs, for instance, and major international charities, major multinational corporations, also terrorist groups, or if not, protest movements that spread and cross boundaries. And that is the key term. What is that puts all of these different, very different examples, if you think about it, on the same page? What is putting them on the same plane that would allow us to say all of this is international relations? Well, ultimately, you can think of international relations as relations between, between bounded communities. Bounded communities meaning states, but they could also be empires. Think about relations between empires. A lot of international history has been shaped by, by actors that have been mainly empires rather than nation states. Or think about in the past city states, or think about any other relevant international actors. And a lot of our focus is on relations between these different actors, not necessarily just states. More broadly, what puts all of them together is that international relations is the subject looking, studying transboundary phenomena. Things that happen across boundaries, across borders, across different actors operating in the international system. That's what is our focus broadly defined. And that's why it can encompass all these different phenomena. So what does studying international relations really mean? It means acquiring the knowledge, of course, but primarily the analytical tools to identify, understand, and explain these transboundary global phenomena and this set of relations. So if you study, if you join a degree, a BSc degree in IR, that would be your job, and that would be our job to provide you with this knowledge and analytical tools and for you to develop these tools. There's also a hidden a component I always say. And if you go back to my example of protests and revolutionary movements, as I mentioned there, you may think of this as primarily domestic, right? But actually they're not, as I've, I've tried to show you, they're just not. And this is just one example. And part of your job in a BSc degree in IR, in international relations, is to start revealing the international component of anything taking place in the world. So anytime, you know, you look at an event, think of it, is that really purely local? Is that just purely a domestic event? 
in an IR degree, you will be pushed to think about the international history of that event, the international co causes of that event, the international setting of that event, okay? And also their international repercussions and meaning. So that is also part of your job. I always say, you know, if I want to give you an example of what your job is during an international degree program, it's really what you see in this next slide. This is a sculpture of biology at the world upside down that you can find on the LSC campus. And it's literally the world upside down. And your job is a task during the green in IR is not that different from that gentleman over there and the lady over there taking a picture, taking a step back, looking, analyzing uh, the world. But not just looking at it, but inquiring it. What does that mean? The world is upside down here because it signals the need to look at things from a completely different perspective. And part of what you will be doing if you study IR is not just to look at the world and the relations and all these transboundary phenomena or specific issues or regions, but it's also to inquire and critically inquire how this has come to be, why there are particular issues, why, for instance, in this picture, the world has those borders and not others, for instance, right? What is there that has to be questioned? What is there that has to be better understood? So part of your job is not that different from what this, uh, these members of the public are actually doing. Inquire, think, and question. Also for another purpose, your job is not just that of thinking and understanding and explaining, but also potentially that of changing the world. So this will be your main task, and this is what you will be doing when studying international relations. Now, why studying then international relations and the LSC? Well, there are a few reasons that I want to highlight. The first one is that if you join as a student the international relations department, you will really be joining a department that has, has kept the conversation on international relations alive, and has to reach this conversation at least since 1927. So by becoming a student of IR at the LSE, you will be joining this debate, this conversation on international relations that has been going on since 1927. You'll also be joining one of the few freestanding IR departments in the world. That means that sometimes BSc international relations degree are delivered in departments that are dealing also with other subjects, namely sometimes these are departments of government, political science, politics and international relations and so forth. Whereas at the LSE, we have a dedicated department just for the study of international relations, which is pretty nice. Um, it's also an international department located in a global city. Namely, it's an international department, and I'll come back to this in terms of the faculty profile, but it's located in a city that is global by definitions. It's a capital city with hundreds of embassies here. So also policymakers coming in and, and living every time. So there's ample opportunity of, you know, attending events or, you know, listening to policymakers or diplomats or other members, NGOs, major NGOs are located in London as well. And this makes it for a much broader conversation on international relations. He'll be at the very center of one of the key cities in this regard. And I also noted you'll be part of a new building just last year. We joined, uh, we moved to the new central building in the campus, which is particularly nice. Something that I mentioned, an international department. I mean, we have, we're fully dedicated to the study, research and teaching in international relations, which means that we have more than 40 faculty members at different levels conducting research and teaching IR. And that means that a key element, a key defining element of our, of our department is its diversity and pluralism. Every member of faculty brings not only a particular research expertise or area, but also different theoretical perspective, a different view on the same subject. And this is invaluable. This is invaluable for teaching, for learning, for research. You will always be exposed to these different ideas. And it's not just the faculty, it's also the student body. We have roughly 200 undergraduate students at any time, and these are students coming from all over the world. And my advice, if you study and want to study international relations, the best thing possible is to study the art in a department that, that, that reflects this diversity of pluralism, but also where you have the possibility to study international relations with your colleagues coming from all over the world. They will never see the same issue from the same perspective as you, and this is particularly enriching. Then, rather obvious point, but it's an important one, you will be joining a department that has world-leading researchers on international relations. And this is particularly valuable in particular at some point in your degree, which I'll cover in a second. Just to give you a quick overview, our um, research expertise can be structured both, uh, both around the key issues and subfields in the, in the discipline of international relations, 
and also in terms of the, the area specialism, the regional specialism of our experts. So in terms of the subfields and the issues that we cover in our research, our research is usually focused around four main clusters. There are those faculty members looking primarily, for instance, at, at, at international relations theory, looking at the key concepts and theories to understand and explain international affairs. Other will, others will look more at issues of international security, issues of war, conflict, including civil wars and their international repercussions. Others are looking more issues of international institutions, international institutions, international law and ethics. So the normative issues, it's not just policy, it's not just realpolitik, but there is also the normative and ethical dimension of it, and international institutions dealing with global issues. And finally, to go back to the Suez Canal examples, some of our research is focusing instead mainly on international political economy, namely all the financial, trade, and other economic relations that shape international politics today. In terms of our specialism, in our department, we have colleagues working primarily on Europe, namely European Union and European affairs, Russia and Russia, Russian foreign policy and its relations with other great powers and also with its neighborhood. United States, I'm part of actually of this area of specialism. I focus myself on US grand strategy and foreign policy, but we have many others, Professor Peter Trubovitz and others still mainly with US foreign policy. Middle East, we have major expertise in the Middle East. Uh, we're, we're, we've been great in terms of our specialism in the Middle East for many years, for many years, and we have great faculty members on this. East and Southeast Asia, again, another strength, uh, point of strength for our department. South America, more, more and more, and also, of course, Sub-Saharan Africa. One thing that I want to highlight, however, is that it's not just about studying sometimes these regions and these countries on their own. Sometimes it's, you know, these courses delivered by experts in this era specialism will also connect these regions. So sometimes it is about the relations of a particular country towards a particular region or US policy, for instance, towards the Middle East, or sometimes again, the connections between these, these different regions. For instance, we have a course looking at the relations between China and the global south. So it's China's relations with South America, China relations with Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's not only a focus on these regions or in case an old fashioned um, focus on Western powers and countries vis-a-vis -vis the so-called global south, but more and more a growing research expertise and teaching in the relationship within different regions in the global south, which is particularly exciting. Just a clarification before I move to telling you a bit more about the BSc program in international relations. The BSc program in international relations is the only BSc program housed and managed and delivered by the LSE International Relations Department. So this is the program I'll be telling you more about in a second. However, I just want to flag up that there are also uh, three joint degree programs where we collaborate with other departments and there are housed in other departments that combine the study of international relations with another subject. So for instance, the, govern depart the government department runs the joint degree BSc politics and international relations. The international history department runs the BSc international relations and history program, and the language center runs the BSc program in IR and Chinese. So if you're interested in these joint degree programs, I strongly recommend that you check the information and video briefings provided by these departments separately. But for the time being, I'll be focusing mainly on the BSc International Relations program. So what is our program and what is our approach to international relations? As it may appear evident, our approach is the more expansive approach to international relations. Namely, we're looking not only at states, and of course, we'll spend a lot of time looking at states, but also beyond states, beyond non, you know, looking at non-state actors, but also looking at other global issues that are going beyond states. Our focus is also a focus that combines theory and practice. And this is a key element of, in general, not just our department, but teaching and learning at the LSE. So we will ask, especially for instance, in the first year, we'll immediately give you an introduction to key concept, concepts and theories in international relations, but we'll immediately combine that with a focus on practice and policy, key current issues in international affairs and the policy makers perspectives onto this. We always make this just for a very simple reason, the two go hand in hand and we're very keen for you to be strong at both levels. As I mentioned before, this is the degree delivered by the department that is big in numbers, but also, but also that encompasses a lot of different perspectives. So 
one characteristic characteristic of our BSc program is its diversity and pluralism in the theoretical approaches that you will encounter. You will study realism, you'll study liberalism, but you'll also study critical theory. You will study you will study uh, postcolonial theory. You look at gender in IR. There's much much more than you will explore. And finally, research led teaching, namely our our professors and and faculty members, they are world leading researchers and their teaching and the content of the courses you will be take will reflect the research they're also conducting at the time, which is an invaluable experience because these are things on and issues on which they're working at the moment. And you will be the first one to engage them on the, on the results of their research and to be at the receiving end and discussing these this research results. And this is particularly the case in your third year where most of your courses will be optional, very specialized courses run by one of our mem members of faculty and focusing on a very specialized issue on which they're conducting research and i cannot tell you how exciting that is it's also just one of like an improved bsc program is a program that has over the last three or four years has been reviewed and improved to, to provide further support and choice so for instance there are new courses in academic support that have been, have been established three years ago for first year students i'll tell you more about this in a second uh, in the last three years, students have had also more choice in year two and three. There's definitely more and more support for those students in year three that want to write a final dissertation in international relations. And we've also included over the last few years new forms of assessment. I'll tell you more in a second on all these elements. First, just an overview. This is information you can find, of course, on our web pages, but I just want to go through very quickly the structure of the program. As you know, the program goes and is structured around three years. The first year is the first year is really about laying the foundations of your understanding and training in international relations. So you'll be studying IR 100, which is the course giving you all the, all the training in key concepts and theories in international relations, again, focus on theory, but also you'll be taking IR 101, more focus on practice and policy and current affairs and international issues. Examples of lectures covered uh, over the last few years, the nuclear program in North Korea and its implications, the issue of populism in international relations, where you know the Syrian civil war is going, the issue of refugee crisis in Europe and in Turkey, for instance, the issue of women and peace in international affairs, the issue of climate change and so on and so on. So you'll be doing both, both are core course and are compulsory. There's also something that I want to flag up, which is this course, IR102, Thinking Internationally. This is a compulsory five-week course that all first-year students in the, in, in the BSc IR program will take. And this is intended to provide you with an introduction to the basic academic skills required to, to perform well and to deliver in your courses in international relations at the LSE in the IR department. So we'll be looking at things such as how to write an essay, in international relations, how to deliver an effective class presentation in international relations, how to communicate and research international relations, how do you take notes at academic level in international relations. The reason why I'm flagging this up is because, because we know that a lot of your education in the very last few years in high school has been disrupted by the COVID pandemic and all that has encompassed. So this is even more important, this course is even more important now to make sure that you're all introduced to basic academic skills that will be required. Then you will also be required in year one to take one international history course because it's particularly foundational for us, but also one outside option. If the first year is about foundations, the second year is about breadth. Here in your second year, you will explore different subfields in the discipline of international relations. So you will have the possibility to choose three out of five semi-core courses in, in international relations, whether international political theory, international security, foreign policy analysis, international institutions, or international political economy. You can pick three out of five, and then for your fourth unit, you can pick an outside option, which can be, again, a language course or another outside option, or in case you can pick another one of the semi-core courses in IR. Finally, your year three will be about specialization. You will take primarily short courses that are really specialized on specific issues. So this is particularly exciting, as I said, because these are usually research-led courses. We'll be focusing on very advanced topic and very specialized topics. And in third year, you have the option, this is not compulsory, but you have the options to write a final dissertation in IR, which will give you the opportunity to further specialize on one particular topic. 
this is not compulsory, as I said, but more and more our students are taking this opportunity. And let me say, it's a great opportunity. How's teaching delivered? Probably speaking in any university, namely a combination of different elements. The first one is lectures. Lectures are the frontal lectures where the, the convener, the lecturer of the day, will deliver the lecture, usually the last one hour. Um, usually there is some space for Q&A, but it's mostly the passive learning component of, uh, of your course, this one. There are lectures for each course, one lecture for each course every week. And it's there to provide you an introduction on key topics or issues that week, to giving you the foundations for understanding uh, the, the weekly topic and also to provide an entry point to key debates. Every lecture will also be followed by one class every week for, e for every course. So for instance, you will have one lecture every week for IR100 followed by one class every week for IR100 and the same for IR101 in your first year and so forth. If the lectures is more the passive learning thing, where you, you, you take notes and think about what has been said to you, the classes are the active learning component of teaching is where you are required to take center stage and discuss the issues and questions that you've been assigned, led by an, another academic, your class teacher, where you'll be discussing key seminar questions, key class questions, and the readings that you've been assigned that week. As I said, this requires your participation, your contribution, and is about your ideas, exchanging ideas in an informed, structured way with your colleagues, in a way that it also shows your preparation. And this is, this is the third component, really, readings and independent study. A key element that distinguishes university life and learning is readings and independent study. You will be required to study independently on the reading list that you will be provided on each course in order to prepare for your classes mainly, so that you can come prepared and be ready to part, be part of that conversation. And this is a requirement. Assessment is done in a couple of different ways. A key difference to be aware of is that in every course, you will be required to submit what we call formative coursework. This is compulsory coursework. It can be, for instance, a formative essay where you will get feedback and a mark, but that mark does not count towards the final mark, your final mark in that course. So you will, you will ask, why then do I have to do that? Well, the reason is simple. It's a way to allow you to train and learn and get feedback on a relevant skill and, and, and topic or sets of topics in the course. In order for you to get feedback, improve your essay writing skills or any task that you've been given so that you can better prepare and build on this in view of your summative coursework, which is the coursework on which you're actually assessed in each course. This could be a summative essay, or it could be, for instance, another summative component or a final exam. The mark you get in summative components does count towards your final mark. In terms of type of summative assessment, the majority will be assessed by a combination of final examination at the end of the year or summative essays, which is a long paper on a specific issue, or sometimes a combination of the two. But more and more, the courses in international issues have included new forms of assessment, namely class participation. So you'd be marked, let's say, for 10% of your marking in a particular course via your participation and contribution class, via class presentations, whether individual or group presentations. In IR101, for instance, you would be asked to deliver a group presentation, and the mark you get there will count for 20% of your final mark in IR101. Blog entries and weekly writings more and more, even films and short documentaries. This is the case, for instance, in one of those specialized courses in international relations that you will take, or you can take actually in year three, which is visual politics of international relations. So this is a few information about teaching and learning assessment. As I said, independent study is key at university life and is key in the international relations department. So you'll be required to study, to think a lot about this before coming, uh, coming to class about all that you've thought in the, uh, you've thought in the, the lectures about what you prepared before class and to be prepared for that. But that independent study is something that I always mention to all students, especially to prospective students and first year students, doesn't mean that you'll be alone. Quite the contrary, there are different layers of support available in the department and outside the department within the broader school at the LSE. So first and foremost, you will be all assigned an academic mentor. The academic mentor is a member of faculty, just like me and any of my colleagues, that will be there to provide you with academic guidance anytime you have any questions connected to your degree or your courses, and also when needed, you will be there also to provide you with additional feedback. But 
the academic mentor is also there to act as a main point of contact for any queries you have. And it, the academic mentor could also help you and provide support for any non-academic issues or questions. So it will always be there, your, your academic mentor will always be there for any queries you, you may have on anything related to your degree or beyond that, or in case will be there to direct you to the relevant people or units in the school or in the department. So all, each one of you, if you join the LSEI department, will be assigned an academic mentor. There's more support available. First and foremost, you're always welcome to contact any members of the IR uh, department faculty if you just simply want to have a chat about a particular topic on which that a member of faculty is an expert of, but also more broadly, if you want to have a follow up on a particular lectures and so on. In addition to that, you can always contact me as the departmental tutor. Departmental tutor is our term at LSE to describe the program director for the BSc program. I will always be there for any other questions, academic related or, or you know, or other personal issues that you may have during, during your stay at the LSC. So anything that you know where you need further advice in addition to your academic mentor, you can always contact me for any queries. And this is within the department. Beyond the department, there are two things that I want to flag up. One is LSC Live, which is our study skills hub. This is a place uh, where located in the LSE library where they run workshops and training sections on all the relevant academic skills, where there's essay writing, dissertation writing, class presentations, how to take effective notes on your readings and so on. So this is a great resource that we have at the LSE that I always strongly recommend that students could use. If instead, you know, you have queries that are not, not to do with academic issues or your academic skills, there is also the LSE Wellbeing Office. The LSE Wellbeing Office is particularly important in two cases, primarily. First and foremost, if you have any disability, if you join the, um, the degree at the LSE, any degree at the LSE, you can discuss with the LSE Wellbeing Office all the support available and all the adjustment that could be made, made available to you in order for you to enjoy your stay and enjoy your time in the LSE and to perform effectively in your courses anytime. But also the LSE Wellbeing Office offers fantastic support to all our students for any personal issues, okay, for any personal health or mental health issues. So it's something where that is also worth highlighting. Something else to say is not only exclusively what the department members of faculty or other colleagues in the department and the school can offer, but also what your colleagues can offer. There are two initiatives that are particularly important, I would say. One is the Student Academic Mentors Initiative, which is students just like you, just more senior than you. So if you join us in first year, there would be second year students or third year students. They are there to provide further academic support, further academic guidance. So it can give you some tips on you know, the courses to take or how to approach certain courses and particular challenges. There's also the peer support initiatives. These is that are students, again, volunteers, that are there to help with any well-being questions or issues, whether it's disability, whether it's mental health issues, and so on. And I want to flag this up because it, it's a fantastic, great other network of support provided by the school and provided directly by our, our own students. There are many IR students involved in these initiatives. There are also some other perks. Let me highlight them as well. If you join the uh, BSc International Relations Program, first and foremost, some of you may decide to take as part of your degree an outside course option in a language course. So that is allowed by our program regulations, actually something that we, we're also encouraged to learn a foreign language. But some of you may decide not to do so, to take other outside options, let's say international history, government, um, economics, and so on and so on. But in that case, you can also take language, even language courses offered by our language center at the LSE. In that case, there is a cost, of course, to pay, there's a fee to pay, but as a BSc International Relations student, you can always apply for our modern foreign language grants as a way for you, for the department to cover the cost of that evening course, language course. So there's an opportunity given to you as BSc International Relations students. More importantly even, we also offer internet internships and career development support to all our students. First and foremost, every year we open up some research assistantship positions. So every year there are some of our colleagues that need some help with their research projects, whether they need bibliographical research help, whether they need help with their case studies, whether they need help with their data, 
connection and analysis, whether they need uh, help in, you know, in collecting or analyzing other information. And this is a fantastic opportunity because this will allow our students, our undergraduate students, to work closely with a member of faculty on a research project. And this can provide our students and has provided our students with fantastic research skills and experience. So every year we open up this position and you will be able to apply for this position. If instead you're interested in you know, taking internships in let's say charities and NGOs or small and medium uh, size enterprises, we also have the LSE IR internship fund. This will allow us to, at the department and the school, to fund your internship what in this in an internship in an organization an ngo or a small enterprise that you find and you applied for and where you secured an internship place sometimes these organizations may not have the funds to cover a basic salary so this is where the internship fund steps in to allow you to take that position but also to have your expenses co covered and a, and a small salary as well we also run the spheres of influence events here where we bring in People working in international institutions, diplomacy, NGOs, private sector, consultancies, and so forth, to give you their experience of what it means working in these different sectors. So how did they get there? What, what is required to work there? And if they study international relations, how did the degree in IR help them to get there? It's a very interesting one. I've talked about academia, I've talked about studying and learning a lot, I've talked about languages, I've talked about careers, but it's also just not about that. As you know, it's also about the social element to that and the social life around your degree. And in this regard, the other department helps in different ways. First and foremost, every year we usually go to this, res this uh, location just outside a part of the Windsor Park, just outside London, which is Cumberland Lodge, where we run a two, three days conference on international relations, where we bring some of our students and also our, some of our members of faculty to discuss via various panels and Q&A sessions on a topic, but in a more informal way outside the university outside the classroom and it's usually a great a great social social event for our students and also for our members of faculty i would say it's a great conversations happen there and it's something that we're keen to repeat and i think as soon as that is possible we'll be able to repeat it also um, in the next academic year then our students also run a student union society on international relations called the grimshaw club which runs fantastic events and also when that is possible a trip uh, to, to, a, to a country abroad to again to provide other opportunities for engagement with relevant speakers and thinking about international relations but there are also many other relevant student union societies at the LSE that might be of particular interest to our students I'm thinking here about the United Nations uh, Student Society I'm thinking here about the Amnesty International Student Societies and many 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 more we also run uh, often the Wednesday Night Lives, which is opportunities again to talk about a particularly interesting or timely weekly topic that is particularly relevant on that week. But to do so again in a formal setting where one member of our faculty, um, you know, guides the discussion, but with our students again informally in front of some slices of pizza so that we can have, we can have a chat in a very, very relaxed way about a, a key items in the news that week. So this is just some of the perks and the advantages of and the social elements and events connected to the BSc International Relations Programme. How do you enter the programme? So as I said very briefly, um, traditionally our students come from either the International Baccalaureate or A-levels and usually our students will have done politics, history and related discipline. However, it's not unusual for our students to come also from a wider set of subject area backgrounds. If so, you can apply, but make sure to show your commitment to the subject, to the subject of international relations in your personal statement. And also to be sure that you have the level of quality that the LSE requires. So even if you don't have, you know, that background in political IR and related discipline that fits that perfectly, something that you can still discuss with the LSE undergraduate admissions office okay to see whether you would still be able to apply and it's not unusual for some of our students to come from a wider set of subject areas however for more information please check the relevant information and briefings provided by the LSE undergraduate admissions office as they will be able to cover all of this in greater details finally where do our students go well, the good news, and it's something that I'm, I'm quite proud to highlight, is that 94% of our undergraduate leavers, our undergraduate um, uh, students, 
after completing the, the program, are working or studying six months after graduation. Studying meaning usually, of course, master students or MPhil, or, sorry, master's programs or MPhil programs, but you know, others are also working. It's 94% of them. So it's particularly effective and successful program. But where do they go? Now, of course, given the nature of the program, some of our students will go into government and civil service, think about diplomacy, think about all the broad civil service jobs available in other ministries, or also politics. So they may end up in parties or working for relevant bodies in politics more broadly. Again, doesn't, it shouldn't surprise you that some of our students will end up working for international institutions and organizations more broadly. So it could be the United Nations, it could be a regional or, or, or supranational organization such as the European Union or other regional organizations such as ASEAN and other African Union and so forth. Many of our students also will work for NGOs, major NGOs such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and so on. Uh, what I want to highlight is that a degree in international relations, and you should not think of a degree in international relations as a degree that would only open doors in these sectors. Many of our students also will proceed working with, in the banking and financial sector, in accounting as well, in consultancies and in media. And this is because uh, in many of these sectors value not just, you know, the, the you know, training in economics, let's say in the case of or finance, in the case of banking, but also the value, the knowledge and perspective that our students could bring to the table in terms of contextualizing and knowing about international context in which, in which events and even economic and financial developments take place. So especially if you specialize in international political economy, that is also one you know, avenue that you can take. But consultancy and, and, and risk, and, and risk analysis, anal analysis is also another big sector for our graduates and also media. So there are former students that have been working for BBC and newspapers, again, because they can bring to this their knowledge and experience of the world and understanding of the world. So the key point here is that there are, of course, the avenues in terms of, you know, most closely connected to IR, but a degree in IR also opens up doors in other sectors, and this is also where our, our students end up with. But for more information, please attend the LSE Career Talks and video briefings, as they will provide more information on this. That's pretty much for me. I hope you find this useful and, and, and valuable to understand what the subject of international relations is and what our BSc IR degree can offer. However, I know that we will have an opportunity for uh, Q&A questions and answers later on in the year. However, for the time being, I just want to thank you for your time and we hope you will join our BSc IR program. So thank you for everything and goodbye.